Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Bill Gamble. Um, when Tom Anderson resigned, the committee got together and for some reason I didn't step back fast enough. Um, <laughs> so he stuck with me as the interim chair until August. Um, I'll do my best. If you don't think it's good enough, tell me. We'll see what we can do. Um, I'm a pretty casual sort of guy. But I'm a bit like a dog with a bone when I'm chasing an issue, as some people already know. So we'll see how we go. Um, tonight we've got a really good agenda, I think. A bit different. We set out to do an environmental thing and it just came together with speakers. Unfortunately, this afternoon, we came up yesterday and filled into today, um, Alice Haythorn felt unwell and was unable to participate, um, which is sad. I'd already seen her presentation, and those who know Alice would know the quality of what she could present for us. Totally backed by science, and she has a really good delivery. So we can probably squeeze a little bit more time in for Yolandi, who's going to talk to us about Wombat Rescue. Um, I've seen her presentation now. I took a sneak preview this afternoon. Thank you, Yolandi. And, um, I've seen Kirsten's from the Conservation Council who's talking to us on the Gas Free ACT project, which is also something very close to my heart. So I'm looking forward to that and I'm looking forward to some really good questions and hopefully we can give you some answers. Um, but first, um, we would like to do an acknowledgement of country and I'll hand over to Shelby, who's one of our committee members here. Thanks, Bill. We are honoured to be meeting on the ancestral lands of an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We acknowledge these first Australians as the traditional custodians of this land, whose cultures are among the oldest in human history. We pay respect to the elders of the communities in the Murrumbidgee region and extend our recognition to their descendants, descendants past, present and future. Thank you, Shelby. Now, Yolandi, do you want to take over? Wow us with your presentation. I'll try my best. Thank 
Thank you. I'm going to need a mouse. Oh, thank you guys for being here, braving the cold. Really appreciate it. Um, my name is Yolanda, as Bill said. I am the founder and president of Wombat Rescue. Um, and we will be talking about wombats tonight, the, the plight of wombats, the challenges they face, and things that you can do to help. So before we start, just a quick little bit about me. I founded Wombat Rescue four years ago. I came to this country eight years ago. I met a little wombat joey in Batemans Bay in a zoo. Someone brought out this fluffy little thing and I said, oh, please can I hold it? And I lost my heart on this little animal. Unfortunately, my husband was diagnosed with leukemia and he passed away 12 months later. And I had to do something, otherwise I would have lost my mind. And I started volunteering at a wombat sanctuary and I soon realized that this is not quite what I want to do because all the animals that come into a sanctuary are orphaned. So something is happening out there on the roads or farms or cities or what, something is happening to make them come in as orphans and that's why I wanted to be. I want to be out there helping them. So I started doing rescue work, um, documenting my joys and journeys and tribulations. I started this Facebook group and Wombat Rescue was born. Um, at the moment, what I'm doing is focusing on rescue primarily and also main treatment programs and education awareness, which is why I'm here tonight. So why are we here tonight? Why are we talking about wombats? If we want to understand the challenges that they face, we have to have the correct context. Um, there's a few things about wombats that's a myth that people still perpetuate, like their numbers are in abundance or you know that their numbers are growing and this is simply not the, not the case. Um, wombat ranges have been decreasing steadily. I don't know if you guys can see those. So those are the three wombat species. We've got the southern hairy nose, northern hairy nose and the bear nose. And those colours are their former range and their current range. And their ranges have been decreasing primarily from um, land clearing on farms. And it's been to such an extent that the southern hairy-nosed wombat now only have fragmented populations and they have been classified as endangered. The northern hairy-nosed dwindled to 36 wombats, only 36 in the 80s, until the government then finally stepped in and do something about it. Their numbers are now 250, so you can see there's only two small spots where you can find them. They're all enclosed, they're very protected. They're also classified as critically endangered. And then the bare-nosed wombat, my beloved wombat, you can see in the little area. And just to interrupt myself, the most amazing, amazing thing for me as an outsider from another country is when you come to this country and you realize of all the places in the world, the only, only place you can find a wombat is on these little eastern and southern parts of Australia. That's the only place you can find them. Surely we should be protecting them. So with the bare-nosed wombat, their numbers are steadily declining. You can see that their range is getting less. Um, they used to be called the common wombat. They are definitely not common anymore. And they do face quite a significant range of, of challenges. The classification for the bare-nosed wombat also is least concern and that is why I'm here tonight. This is why I'm talking to MLAs, this is why I'm talking to ministers, this is why I'm talking to people like you guys and councils and doing presentations because they are in trouble. And if we don't do something now, they will follow the same route as their cousins towards extinction. So why do I say that they are in trouble if they are classified as least concern? Because they face so many challenges. These are only six of the main challenges. They obviously have, diff there's, there's more. But in terms of natural disasters, and last year was a very good example of a storm in a teacup, the perfect storm, because in one season they faced extreme drought, bushfires and flooding. And I do get asked the question, the question a lot about the bushfires last year because we did a lot of work in the Talaganda National Park 
And what people don't realize is that the bushfires didn't necessarily harm them, although there was not a shred of food left in Talaganda. They had nothing to eat, so we support fed them for months. But what wiped out a lot of their numbers is the flooding just after the bushfire. So hundreds of wombats drowned last year in April and May after the, the flooding. Um, so in terms of natural disasters, that's what they face. But then there's also man-made introduced challenges, I guess we can call it. So they get killed by cars. All of us have seen the amount of roadkill. It's interesting coming from a third world country in South Africa where we literally have no roadkill. You don't find roadkill. All the wildlife is in contained national parks. You don't see dead animals necessarily on the roads. And then when I came to Australia, it was quite evident to see so many roadkill. It was such a different stark contrast between the two countries. And you have to, you have to ask yourself why? Why is this happening? I mean, we do have a lot of wildlife, but why are we hitting them? Is there not something we can do about that? The other challenge that wombats face is being shot by farmers, whether that's legal or illegal. There's a lot of culling. Permits are being issued for culling, and um, that's quite a significant threat for them. And then there's mange. Mange is probably, at this stage, the biggest threat. And the reason I say that is it's not as well known you all probably have heard of chlamydia and koalas and you've heard about facial tumors in um, Tasmanian devils, but people don't necessarily realize that mange is the same as scabies when we get it. Or they don't realize that mange is terminal in wombats. If they have mange, they will die, so they don't get better. Once contracted, it's about a six to 12 month journey of incredible suffering before they die. Don't get poisoned. Yes. Yeah. So the problem is, because they have been classified as least concern, there's no conservation efforts to help them. There's no programs in place from the government to save them, to help them with mange. And this is where wildlife groups are trying their best. But, you know, it's, it's much bigger than us. We estimate that more than 70% of the bear nose wombat populations already have been infected with mange. So this is all the problems that they face. And the last three, the man-made ones, are the ones that I wanted to focus on tonight. So in terms of wildlife vehicle collisions, there was a study done by Syro who estimated that we kill around four million mammals every year on our roads. That's an insane amount of, of animals. I, I can't even imagine the financial cost to vehicle repairs that that would, that would um, cause. So this leaves just over half a million orphans and about 50,000 of those um, are being rescued. So this places an enormous burden on rescuers and carers and sanctuaries because none of us are funded by government. All of us work on donations and all these animals that come into care need food and they need shelter. You need infrastructure. And a typical wombat that comes into care as a small little pinky takes about two years to raise from pinky to release. So that's a, a long time intensive and costly commitment. Um, the other thing that I've been thinking about is we don't probably have adequate training. I brought my, license, my driver's license from South Africa, so I haven't gone through the training courses in Australia, but there's no wildlife modules, there's no training our young people when they get licenses. How do you avoid a kangaroo? How do you drive when it's wet and it's foggy and there's an animal jump in front of you? So it's, it's small things that we can do to change that. And I think one of the things that I find the most traveling so far and wide, especially at night when I do rescue, is that we have inappropriate speed limits on our roads. You have a rural road in New South Wales with no shoulder, it's surrounded by farms, so you can assume that there could be livestock on the roads. I, I found a horse one night, and the speed limit is still 100. And people drive 100 in the dark, and these animals, you know, it's just not safe. <coughs> the second challenge, as I mentioned, is culling. So in three years' time, 2017 to 2019, combined with New South Wales and Victoria, 12, over 12,000 wombats were shot. And this is just legal culling. This is permits that's been issued to farmers who said they interfere with my crops or they damage my fences or you know they compete with, with food or water. 
the amount of wombats being shot illegally could possibly be double that, so we don't know. I've seen farmers going on national TV saying, I'm not going to bother with a permit, no one is policing me, I, you know, I will just do it. So unfortunately that's, that's a, a big part of what they face. Um, the third one, the one that I can talk about for hours, and I won't, is mange. So with mange, the, the biggest problem is, this is not a skin disease, it's a parasite. So mange might burrow us under the skin of the wombat. She lays eggs about three to four per day. She lives four to six weeks. So by the time a wombat looks like this, they could have about a thousand mites per square centimeter on their body. And it's really, really painful for them. The thing that I'm trying to do is to raise that level of awareness so people can actually understand what mange means. It's not when someone say to me, it, it's a little bit uncomfortable. It's really not just uncomfortable. It, it's the fact that they are dying. Once they have mange, they do not get better. What mange does to the intestines is they don't really absorb nutrients because the, the villi and the intestines are destroyed. So this is why you would see a mangy wombat always grazing, but they look thin and emaciated. And um, this is, you know, this, it, it causes the, I, I, I want to say the itching, but it's not just a normal itch like you have a mosquito bite. It's really intense. They scratch until they've got open sores and that could become fly blown and infected. So there's this host of things that they face when they do have mange. So this is quite a stark picture that I've painted. I do apologize for that, but it's not all gloom and doom. There are things that you can do. There are definitely things that we all can do to help them. So in terms of road safety, there's a few things that you can do as a driver. Driving to conditions simply means assess your surroundings. If it's foggy, if it's dark, if there's no shoulder, if you know this is a wildlife zone, you don't have to drive 100. If it says 100, you can slow down a little. Um, it would be good if people report injured wildlife because it's just simply cruel to either hit an animal or see that an animal is, has been hit and they're still alive and you don't do anything. And I'm very cognizant of the fact that we live in a really large country and sometimes you are in an area where there's no reception. I, I completely get that. It would be good though if you could at least call a wildlife group near you when you do um, get back into reception. One thing that I remember when I came to this country is me being an animal lover, seeing wildlife dead. It never occurred to me to stop and check pouches. I never knew. It, I didn't put two and two together, so, and I still feel very guilty about that. But now that I know, and now that I've learned that there could be little ones, I have learned to do that. And it's something I would encourage everyone to do. Um, you know, it's not as confronting as you would think. There's training available. I'm more than happy to show people how to do it. But at the end of the day, it could save a life. If you stop for five minutes and check a pouch, you could save a little pinky or joey. The second thing you can do in terms of landhold engagement, this is something that I'm quite passionate about because most of the bare nose wombat populations would be found on private property. So their lives literally are in the hands of our farmers. And farmers haven't always seen wombats in a very positive light. They feel that there's a lot of damage being done and this is where the culling permits came in. But if we start that conversation at least and start to raise the profile of wombats and start to talk about the fact that there are alternatives to culling, you know, we can have innovative ideas like wombat gates. A wombat is a very habitual animal. They have a certain path, pathway where they want to walk and they've been walking that pathway for generations. We came along and we built a road over that pathway or we built a fence over that pathway. So of course they're going to destroy the fence. But if you understand their behavior and you know that there are certain areas where they want to walk and you install a wombat gate, they will use that. Um, and I have been working with how in the UK, in, in, especially in areas they locate where there's traditional paths for deer or uh, badgers or the wildlife, they actually create mini bridges yep. for wildlife so they can pass underneath the roadway. Do you know where the Australian um, local governments are working for that? In 
terms of roads, to cross busy roads, I don't, I don't foresee that that will happen just because of the size of this country. There's one specific road in New South Wales that I have been gathering data over for three years now, and I find between two to 15 dead wombats every week on that particular stretch of road. And that's just 30 kilometers. So in terms of the millions of kilometers of road we've got, I, I, I don't think financially that could be viable, which is a shame. Yeah, they, what they do is they identify key areas where there's particular high density, particular I've, I've seen those photos and yeah, they are brilliant. If, we, if, if our government says yes and they will do it, I'll be the first one to cheer them on. It will be good. Yes? There's someone in Brisbane, uh, somebody in Brisbane, I forget that, years ago they showed it on TV, where they had a park, a wildlife park, overpass, mm -hmm. and they trained all the wildlife park with that, and they wanted something to do until they got used to it. Yeah. The cars were not moving and they were over the top. I've not seen that one. That's something to look into. Look, it's, it's, if, if we could have this culture of actually starting to look after our wildlife and not just accepting that we will kill them and four million of them on the roads, that would be fantastic. Definitely. I would love doing that. Is there any science behind the coming numbers? Why are coming to such progress? There's no science. No, there's no policing either. So if you if you are a landowner and you call up and fill in the form and say, I've got 20 more bats, I want to shoot 10 of them because, and then you've got a tick box of reasons, whether it's competing for food with my livestock or they um, do, they cause erosion or they do damage to my fences, it will be approved. I don't know of any permits that's not approved, unfortunately. And it, Trucks are enormous pressure to get from one place to another on time. Now I'm stuck. No, no, they're not. Yeah. No, they're not. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
The last project that I did was in the Google Southern Reserve. We went up to 160 boroughs and I had a group of 12 volunteers with me most Sundays. Some Sundays I was alone. But it's... Uh, yes, yes, some boroughs. They can have up to 10, yes. So it's big, it's, it's, it's a big thing. You don't have, if you can't be physically involved in doing that side of work, you can financially support your local wildlife group. You can help conversations. So if you are a landowner, you can talk to me, you can introduce me to your neighbor, or you can, if you know a politician, you know, there's always contacts that people have that you can introduce to each other. So we can keep that momentum going and keep that conversation going and raise the, the profile of wombats. So at the end of the day, what I'm trying to tell people about wombats is we have a threatened species list and there's animals that really need our help because there's not a lot of numbers of them left. But with wombats and mange, the suffering that they endure is like no other. The only animal in Australia that suffers as much to that extent are wombats when they have mange. This is why we need to do something now. This is why we work so hard trying to talk to government and departments and parks and conservation services to implement these programs to help them and it's not something wildlife groups can do on their own i mean we we do what we can and i sleep literally three or four hours a night but we do need all of you and we need communities to help we need the government to help because if we want to do a conversation on a national scale with landowners that's a conversation that the government needs to facilitate. I can't go from farm to farm. This is something that's much bigger than just one group or wildlife groups. Um, and then we also need every group to, to work together, governments to work together, communities to work together. So it's really literally the old saying, it will take a village. And that was me. So. If any of you ever need help with a wombat, there's my number. Please call me. I come out day or night. Um, we are quite lucky in the ACT that we do have urban wildlife ranges. So if a, a wombat or a kangaroo needs to be euthanized, we have that service. But in terms of doing rescue, um, there's no other group who does that. So it's good if you have this number, if you do need a wombat to be rescued, call me. Kerry? I had a wombat in my backyard on real estate in the 30th of December last year. And I think it's early. Nowhere near Kilimanjaro Ridge. Maybe. And took the wombat. She went to a sanctuary and she will be released once she's assessed that she's ready. She's very young. Uh, yeah. And very, very thick. There. Hello, I have a question. Um, are there any uh, wombat hotspots in the Western Creek area that you're aware of? Um, on, like on the ridge or... I, I've noticed they're coming more into town lately. I know that Uriara Crossing has a lot of wombats. Yes. Um, but um, yeah, any any more locally that we should be aware of where they might be crossing? Kuliman Ridge definitely has a lot of wombats and there is mange on Kuliman Ridge. Um, in terms of hot spots near this area, is Duffy close, close by? Yeah. Yes. So when you, on, on Cotter Road, just more or less just before, you, or just after you exit Duffy, just before you get to Stromlow, is quite a hot spot. There's a lot of um, accidents that happen there. Any other question? Thank you very much for listening to me. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Landy. It's been great talking to you over the last couple of weeks as well in preparing for this. Okay, so we now have a really interesting speaker who is a great campaigner. This is the second event of hers I've been to today. <laughs> um, Kirsten Duncan from Conservation Council. Thank you very much, Bill, and thank you to the Western Creek Community Council for inviting me to come and speak. Um, as 
Bill says I'm um, from the Conservation Council ACT region. Uh, we are, have been around for about 40 years advocating for environmental issues in the ACT um, and surrounding regions including southeast forests and uh, wildlife conservation etc. We also have quite a broad um, definition of, sort of sustainability issues as well. So, uh, for instance, I'm a campaigner on issues of uh, energy and waste and um, sustainability generally. So, um, I have a presentation here. Yep, good, I've got a mouse. Correct. So the um, Conservation Council is a quite a small organisation. Um, we've got a staff of about six, uh, six permanent employees. Most of us are part-time and we do operate mostly on um, supporter donations and government funding. Um, so this project that I'm going to talk about this evening uh, was funded by the ACT Government uh, Community Zero Emissions Grant. Wrong way, sorry. Okay. So why why talk about gas? Um, gas is a fossil fuel. I'm going to assume that you all understand uh, climate change and uh, fossil fuel contributions to climate change. Gas also has um, some pretty significant environmental impacts beyond climate change. What you're looking at here is um, uh, off Google Maps, this is in um, Queensland, this is the Condamine State Forest and this is a fracking operation. And so each one of those little dots that you can see there is a, um, a, a gas well um, and that's in state forest in Queensland. So um, an operation like this might have up to about 100, uh, sorry, up to about 800 wells. Um, operated by a single company and uh, these are proliferating across the Australian landscape so this is really concerning um, for uh, biodiversity it's also very concerning for farmers um, because gas wells have um, a, a risk of contaminating groundwater and soil So the ACT, as you're probably well aware, has a, um, a target of a net zero emissions by 2045. This was the climate change strategy that was released in 2019. Um, and we have previously had set the target of 100% um, renewable electricity by 2020, which was achieved. So everybody here is now using, or at least offsetting, um, the electricity uh, from renewable sources, mostly wind and solar. Um, some of that as far afield as South Australia and some of it located here in the ACT. So we have 100% renewable electricity. We should be using that rather than burning fossil fuels for energy in our buildings. There is nothing that you can do with gas that you can't do just as effectively with electricity, more efficiently, cleaner, healthier, and better for the environment. So the ACT's emissions now that we have that of um, electricity is 100% renewable. These are the remaining emissions. 22% of that, as you can see, is from stationary gas, and that comes from our buildings. In the ACT, most of that comes from uh, residential buildings as well. Um, we have a history uh, here over many decades of installing gas in homes and um, apartment buildings and so forth. Um, so most of our gas actually comes from where we live and our own use of it. Um, so this means that we cannot achieve net zero emissions in the ACT unless the community get on board and um, take part um, by switching their own homes from gas uh, to electricity. Sorry, I will get the hang of this eventually. Right, um, last year there was an election, uh, as you would remember voting, I'm sure. The result of the um, election was this parliamentary and governing agreement, um, and 
It has a focus on phasing out fossil gas in the ACT by 2045. These are some of the um, uh, initiatives that are included in that parliamentary agreement. Uh, so you've probably heard of the zero interest loans. Um, that's a new scheme that is uh, being piloted at the moment. Uh, the first of those loans are being made available um, within the next couple of months. Um, assuming that the design of that scheme works well, uh, the, the government's intention is to roll that out um, in 2022 to a wider audience. It will be means tested, so, um, uh, and, but it is available or will be available for a range of different electric technologies, including vehicles, uh, solar systems, um, and uh, heat pumps, etc. Does that include I'm not entirely certain of the details. Um, a lot of that is still yet to be released in, in detail. Um, there are some MLAs here tonight who may be able to answer that question for you. $15,000 like half an electric <laughs> No, no that's, that's true. Anyway, so quick poll, who here has gas in their home or has had gas in their home? Most of us, yeah. That's pretty typical across Canberra. Yeah, over there as well, yeah, yeah. So has anyone switched any of their appliances, heating hot water or cooking from gas to electric? Yeah, we've got a couple. Yeah, at the back there. Anybody thinking about doing that? Great, all right. So there's a few people here who maybe haven't started thinking about that. Um, and so um, at the Conservation Council, we decided we would um, put together a project that helped Canberra households um, understand the need to switch off gas and also some really practical assistance for doing it. Oh, sorry, right. So we came up with this project called Make the Switch. Um, so this is the um, homepage of the website. Make the switch um, to save money on your household bills um, and a number of other messages. So obviously the reason we care about it at the Conservation Council is it's um, part about uh, addressing the environmental aspects um, and climate change and so forth. But why would you guys care about it? Well, because you can save money on household bills, you can improve your family's health and safety, and you can also effectively take action on climate change. And this is really significant for people who, you know, you're doing, you recycle, you compost, you carry your own shopping bags, etc. You've got keep cups or metal straws, or, you know, you're doing all of those sorts of little things, and you're sort of thinking, well, what can I do next? Switching your home from gas to electricity is really significant. Um, switching your uh, petrol car over to an electric uh, car or even better, a bike, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Um, but these are really significant reasons for most people. So how do you do it? Five steps. Firstly, improve your energy efficiency at home. So that's draft stopping insulation. Um, if you've got um, some northerly aspect, you know, letting, letting your winter sun in to, um, to take advantage of that passive solar. The, um, the most effective way to save energy, of course, is just to not use it in the first place. Um, switching your heating. So in most Canberra homes, heating is about 60 to 80% of your bill, particularly in winter and particularly if you've got um, an older house that's not well insulated, you're probably spending a huge amount of your energy on, on heating. Hot water is the next largest um, source of energy consumption in your home. Cooking is a really small proportion, but what you can do once you've, you've ticked off heating, hot water and cooking is that you can then close your gas account. Can I just say something about the reduction of uh, stove tops? Yeah, we'll come to it in a minute, if okay. you like. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what is a heat pump? You might have heard of heat pumps and think, what the heck are those things? Um, it's actually just a reverse cycle air conditioning. In most of the rest of the world, they call them heat pumps. For some reason in Australia, we call them reverse cycle air conditioners, go figure. 
Um, most people are familiar with them for cooling their homes, but they're just as effective for heating your home. Um, they can be installed as a split system or as a ducted system. Um, and generally speaking, you'll have an indoor unit um, which, is, which pumps out the, the cold or warm air and you'll have a compressor unit outside somewhere. It can be installed on the ground or you can mount it on the wall or even on the roof. Um, so there's plenty of versatility about that. <coughs> heat pumps are also used to heat water. Um, and you can, again, you can have a split system like we've got in the, the photograph there, or they may be an all-in-one system where the compressor unit is on the top of the storage tank. It's exactly the same technology, you're just heating water instead of heating air. Not reverse cycle in this instance though. Okay, so induction cooking. I hear so many people say, oh, but I love gas. And we've been taught for decades that gas is better for cooking. It's not. It's dangerous. You've got an open flame. You've got um, noxious gases coming off, particularly if you're not using a range hood or um, your housing is poorly ventilated. You're potentially filling your home with um, some really nasty gases. Carbon monoxide um, does kill people, um, but there's also um, nitrogen oxides um, and, and other VOCs as well. Um, they are having an open flame is obviously um, a safety risk, particularly for, for children or um, um, anyone with um, mobility issues, it becomes a, uh, quite a risk. Induction cooking is not the same as uh, the electric cooking that you may be familiar with in, in earlier decades, you know, the glowing spirals. Is it, the induction cooking is an entirely different technology, uh, so it's electromagnetic. It's very fast, it's efficient, uh, you have instant control. People say, oh, but gas is instant. Induction cooking is instant. You just slide your, slide your finger across the, the, um, the gauge or press a button and uh, you've in, got instant heat control. Um, lots of them have uh, flexible cooking zones and um, come with a range of different safety features including timeouts um, and heat warnings when the, the hot plate is cooling after you, you've finished cooking. Yeah, can I just make a point on that? Yeah. When I first came out, they were cold. You could cook on it, you could touch it, and it would remain cold. And they did save energy. But now, they've done something to them. They use a lot more electricity. So they're very expensive to run. And as you already know, those hot plates are hot. They're not cold anymore. So you can't touch them when you're cooking. And you already know you have to go something to cool down. So if something happened with that, someone has reversed all the good that it was when it first came out. So I don't know if you can talk to these people who are manufacturing them and see what went wrong. <laughs> okay, I'm not, not sure about that. Yeah. that. Um, they do cool down quite quickly um, and you can you know, take the pot off and wipe them down in between cooking if you make a mess and so forth as well. Um, so, once you've switched your appliances over, um, you can take a couple of extra steps. You can close, you see the little yellow um, lever on the left there, that's the stopcock valve on your meter. You can close that to stop um, gas flowing through the meter. You can take the next step of capping the meter, which is uh, what the plumber there is doing, and that will prevent any gas from flowing into your home. Um, and then call the retailer to close your account and that now saves you $320 a year on the supply charge. So rather than paying for electricity, which you already do anyway for power in your home and gas, you can be paying just for the electricity supply charge and save yourself that money. And say goodbye to gas. Um, you do not have to uninstall the meter. Um, that can be quite expensive, um, several hundred dollars, but it's not necessary. Um, you can um, just close the account. So the website um, tackles some of the um, 
uh, quite common questions that people have about switching over to electric appliances um, and some of the myths about gas, gas being you know, natural and clean. Yes, it is a natural product, but so is botulism and asbestos. Um, so, you know, just because something is natural doesn't necessarily mean that it's beneficial. Um, do you have to buy new pots and pans if you get an induction cooktop? Not necessarily. You probably already have some pots. Take a fridge magnet and if it sticks to the bottom, it'll probably work on an induction cooktop. Um, so you're not necessarily starting from scratch. Um, and a whole range of other questions are up there on the website as well. We also uh, list um, the financial rebates um, that are available. So there are some federal schemes. You may have heard of STC, Small Technology Certificates. Um, there are also um, ACT schemes uh, which are applied um, by retailers. We do recommend that people shop around and get multiple quotes um, if you're uh, looking at installation. Um, the first or major retailers are not necessarily going to give you the cheapest deal. Just because somebody offers a rebate doesn't necessarily mean that the total of your bill is going to be smaller. Um, so uh, always get multiple quotes. Um, if you uh, are told by installers that, oh well heat pumps don't work in Canberra, um, you can tell them quite confidently that yes they do and you're going to go and find another installer. Um, plan ahead. Um, installation costs, uh, particularly for uh, if you're going for something like a, a ducted electric heat pump um, air conditioning in your home, can be quite expensive. Uh, we don't necessarily recommend that you switch a ducted gas system to a ducted electric system because it is a really expensive way to do things. You might be better off with um, a couple of split systems, one in the living room, one in you know whichever room you use uh, second most often, that sort of thing. So um, don't necessarily take the first offer. The website also has a calculator, so you can pull out your gas bills, you can put in um, your gas bills and the kinds of gas appliances that you have. You can then play with some options about electric appliances that you um, might, like, might like to replace them with and it will give you a comparison of the running costs and also in, um, some ballpark figures for installation costs as well so you can have a look at what the, um, uh, the payback period might be for you. Uh, it might, um, you know, and also you can choose a price point, you know, are you going to, you know, just look at budget appliances or maybe, maybe you want to go for a more expensive induction cooktop but a cheaper um, uh, heating system. So who's switching to all electric homes? There isn't a typical switcher. There's, um, you know, all sorts of people are doing it for all sorts of reasons. Um, so families, retirees, young singles, um, people um, building new homes are building all electric homes. Um, it can, um, and the motivation um, varies. Some people are interested in the cost savings, others are interested in doing it for um, you know, climate change or other environmental reasons. Uh, we have a, um, a downloadable planner. I've got a few copies of that here if you're actually interested in, in starting to um, consider your options. Uh, so feel free to, to take that or you can jump on the website and print it out yourself. So that's gas. Um, Having a look at this graph again, you can see that the lion's share of remaining um, emissions uh, in the ACT actually come from transport, 62%. It's, um, when I was uh, doing a bit of research about this, um, the ACT government's um, transport strategy says that we make 
11 million kilometres of travel per day in the ACT, which is a pretty staggering figure. And so we did, we did some sense checking on that and it actually is about right. And at least a quarter of that is for people travelling to and from work and about 9 million kilometres of it is in private vehicles, most of them with just a single person in it. So this is another area where we can't get to zero emissions without community involvement. And so um, the Conservation Council today, as Bill said, uh, we were out this morning in the city launching um, a companion project, so Make the Move, um, and this is about helping people to make um, healthier and uh, more emissions uh, free choices about their daily travel around the city. And um, part of this program is uh, a, a workplace based program where we're helping commuters uh, to um, try out electric bikes and electric scooters um, to help them consider other ways of getting around. So they're the, um, the two websites, maketheswitch.org.au, makethemove.org.au. And um, that concludes my presentation. If anyone has any questions, yeah. I have two quick questions. First one, you showed the bracket. Now, I'm going to do my roving on the wall. If I could just stick that uh, If I could just stick uh, Is that working? You would turn that on. It is on. Uh, Australian gas reserves, um, most of our gas is in fact exported. We don't even use it here. And yet we've got um, the gas industry telling us we need to mine for more gas um, to meet demand. Um, whereas in fact it's, it's mostly exported. Um, the fracking is one of the most environmentally damaging forms of, of gas extraction. But we are the, the, the easier to extract reserves are um, becoming ex over exploited and are running out. Well, which is like 50 years or like 150 years time? No, way shorter than that. I can't, I'm not, I'm not sure of the, the particulars, but um, the reserves, particularly in Victoria, have been running short and they are forecasting a shortage of gas in Victoria. And maybe if we could renegotiate it with SA and send a bit to Melbourne, we could get rid of the brown coal and it would be cheaper because it's you know, it gets cheaper overseas and you can yes. so I just I don't like being ripped off things. Yeah, it, it, it is complex. Uh, <laughs> Um, and that, it, it, it has a lot to do with federal import policy back. and, and uh, yes, we import back gas back <laughs> in again, which is absolutely crazy. Um, the um, Beyond Zero Emissions, um, the Australia Institute and the Climate Council um, have all done significant research about um, reducing gas demand uh, and also um, 
replacing gas use in industry, particularly those energy intensive industries. Um, so there is the technology to replace gas in even things like brick making, for instance, or steel making. There are other ways of doing it that don't, don't use gas. And so we really do need to be focused on um, that technology transformation rather than finding alternative sources of, of so gas. We'll agree that fracking's bad. Yeah, fracking's bad, but gas gas generally is bad. Yeah. Sorry, just behind you. Yeah. I think I can talk about it too, but um, look, it's a great presentation, and I understand the issue with gas. But um, what I'm concerned about is uh, taking gas out of um, comparison to gas is assuming that the only other option is electricity, and particularly for heating and um, in Canberra, wood fires are a major source of heating as well. well they're a major pollutant, they're not a major source of heating yet, but if you read um, consumer forums and uh, some editorial in the Canberra Times on the weekend by the wood sellers, um, people are, are, the myth is out there that wood is cheap and they say, um, going to ban gas, push people to electricity, people are saying electricity is expensive, they're not going to go there. But I said, oh, it's are already coming out, the wood sellers are already up to it, they're saying, well, it's not the ambient, it's a home, it's not the wood, it's natural, and the fact that it's toxic and natural, it's the pictures of the person. So it's not a two, it's not a binary choice here, and I think there needs to be some information on CSIRO, some other independent source that says, Wood heating, if you actually burn proper wood in a proper heater, is probably non cheaper than electricity. So, like, there's a whole sector here that's been missed out, and I think we will be really, really sorry if all those people go to wood heating because it's cheap, or yep. they think it's cheap. Yeah, so I agree. I Look, think we need to expand the scope of these comparisons and really get that word out there, and the government you know, we needs to get that <laughs> Yeah, because it, it's happening. Yeah, the, um, uh, we do have a little section in the Q&A on the website about wood heating. Um, environmentally, it is um, dubious. It, it's a, a voluntary uh, standard um, for um, the sustainability of timber for, um, for wood burning, uh, and it's not enforced. So you don't know where your tin, where where your firewood's coming from, is the point. <laughs> it's probably it's I'm quite. Reading, I'm reading someone's yellow Yeah, that's right. You know, I mean, if it's come out of somebody's backyard, you know that it's 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 um it hasn't endangered a forest. But salvage logging is a real environmental issue. Um, we need fallen timber to remain in forests because it becomes part of the um, the ecosystem and the cycling of, of resources. Um, in Canberra, we also have a serious problem with air pollution in winter um, from wood fires. And wood fires in homes, you know, have waxed and waned in popularity over the years here. Um, but I certainly remember, you know, winters uh, where there's just this blanket of smog sitting across the city and we have, you know, at those times when we have those inversion layers in, win in winter, we have the worst air quality in Australia, which is, um, yeah, really quite staggering. The, the emission standards of, of new wood heaters now are much better than they used to be, but um, for environmental reasons and air quality reasons, um, it, it is better to switch to electricity. If you really like the fireplace um, ambience, you can buy electric fireplaces. Um, but also, um, when it comes to how much heating you need, as I said before, you know, energy efficiency in your home uh, should be your number one priority. You can reduce your energy use regardless of what source of heating you're using um, by insulating and draft stopping. If, if yeah. match with the ACT government there, yeah, the ACT government approves high-rise units facing the west without shading and with central gas heat hot water systems opening right this in the next two months there's one near me. So all of those features, it's contrary to all the principles you've outlined. So what's with the ACT government? Are they, they're, they're not following their own rules. That's a really important point. What's going on with building standards in the ACT? It seems to me when we lived in Europe where it really was cold, um, and we're about here, this would be very poorly built. It's 
extracted in the US and Turkey for a period of tax. The, um, the parliamentary agreement, um, the orange covered um, document that I showed you earlier, does have um, the introduction of minimum energy efficiency standards uh, for new developments um, and for uh, rental and public housing. Uh, so those standards will be, um, are being developed, I believe. Um, That's an standard for a high rise so you can have a west-facing unit which completely blows them out of water because they've got to put one on the northeast side, yeah. on the average across, yeah. which means that if you're putting public housing or something in there, you've got to run the air condition the whole time. You've got to really build them on because they just have, they've just been packed in tight. That there's no consideration of energy saving. Or yeah, that's maybe something you can address to it's probably the MLA's. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. But we have two in the last I think we might direct those questions now. Yeah, but new developments are, um, uh, will not have gas put into them, um, and uh, yeah, those standards are being developed. Yes, a question here. Well, the motion of solar, I've got solar hot water since about 2002. I say that's 40% of the electricity in the country. Well, yeah, that's right. Um, while uh, the website does emphasise heat pump technology, um, heat pump technology is, is four to five times more efficient um, in its use of electricity. But if you, but there are other alternatives: um, solar thermal, um, solar PV, um, instant, instantaneous um, electric uh, hot water as well. So there are some other alternatives depending on your situation. Um, if you have solar PV panels on your roof, uh, you might have an electric resistive tank and um, have that heated by your, um, your own solar system. So there are certainly um, some choices. Yep. Yeah, well, just about the wood heaters. There were, was a time when we had to uh, put something in there to filter it so that it really did don't smoke outside. I think the government should go back to that, but that doesn't what I was going to ask you about. There's two things. Firstly of all, in the 1970s we were all told to switch to electric because it was cheaper than we all did. Yep. And then it went skyrocketed up, so we'll have to go back to gas because that was cheap. So I'm a little bit concerned that that's going to happen again, that it's a deja vu. And the other point with the solar panels, yeah, we put them all up there, we paid for everything to put them up there on the roof, and now ActuRadio wants to charge us $40 out of our credit. Because we're stealing their sun, which is a load of rubbish, we're not stealing their sun, they don't own the sun. It belongs to the universe. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you can actually get involved in the world. I've always spoken to HIJ, but the more people who speak to things do, the better, especially with you, yeah. that uh, you stop them from uh, charging us $40 because we've already paid for everything and now we need to get our money back and get yeah. the, um, the Conservation Council um, has been involved um, in the last. Uh, 18 months um, discussing the gas network access arrangements um, and we're also involved in the, um, the consultation process for um, electricity and yet we're certainly advocating for, um, for uh, particularly vulnerable households um, to be supported in the energy use and tariffs um, but also you know, um, helping to defend uh, Canberra's right to have, or you know, their own energy um, through the solar PV, and to have you know um, tariffs which reflect the fact that we um, are increasingly becoming the providers of, of energy for the city. Yeah, at the back there. I was just going to say, um, getting the impression slightly that our gas is limited. Uh, Reasonable studies show that you know. <laughs> if we actually release the um, uh, restraints on gas exploration and exploitation of reserves, we could think it could occur a thousand years um, beyond what we're using now. So, yeah, we try to do it. But I'm just saying that if we want cheap energy and things like that, we're better off using gas, really. It's only the uh, so who do you represent in this? No one. Yes, um, you know, no one. Uh, I'm just saying, it's, you know, 
it's because we've decided not to exploit gas. It's not because of any limits on the gas that we have, or that um, gas is not an excellent place <coughs> in Australia for energy. So if you want to make it inside of the plant science, yeah, if you, well, that's exactly what I'm putting But, yeah. you know, I don't say it's because of it. It's these other concerns, but it's not your logical position. It does become increasingly expensive to access it in, in harder to reach reserves as well. But yeah, I'll take that as a comment. Yeah, sorry at the back. So can I just ask, it's about that um, Bell Grant that could be coming next year. So I'm thinking about I've got solar um, on my roof. And so in terms of, you know, I want to do good for the environment and also recruit my savings eventually. Do you think uh, like a battery is a good idea versus switching gas It does depend on your individual situation, um, uh, you know, how much you're likely to spend on installation of different systems, um, how much energy you use and therefore how, how big a, a, a PV system or how big a battery you might um, choose, um, and also then your eligibility for um, an interest-free loan from the government or um, other uh, rebates. Um, so you would need to, you know, to do your own figures on it. Um, the cost comparison um, calculator that's in the website is limited to uh, heating, cooling and hot water. We deliberately chose to not add in solar PV because that starts to become you know, quite complex um, to, to build into a calculator and we needed to keep it you know, simple so that it was accessible to a large number of people. Yeah, unfortunately you'll need to do your own numbers on that. A few, few years ago, on Four Corners, they had a US farm all about fracking. And the environment was ruined, all the people were getting sick. I can't remember which year it was, but that was some time in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, there, there are definitely um, health impacts for, for um, families who, are, who live near um, fracking. Um, any other questions? I think I've probably entirely used up my time now. I just ask where the electricity is going to come from if we don't use gas and we don't use any other form of fuel. We have cars, buses, trains, all of that sort of. Where's the electricity going to come Yeah, um, we actually need less energy in total if we switch to these electric technologies because they are more efficient. So if we do the, the energy efficiency measures in our homes and reduce the total amount of energy that we're using, if we use electricity rather than gas, we're reducing the total amount of energy that we're using. So the, um, the, the large scale installations that are happening, wind, solar and um, uh, hydro and battery technology, will gradually replace the energy that is currently being generated from coal and uh, gas-fired plants. Um, but we need to be reducing our overall energy demand um, so that we don't have to actually replace that entire um, generation. What we do with the ACT? We have three foggy days in the Well, that's where batteries um, really come in handy, whether that's um, pumped hydro um, or a chemical battery, um, but also the, the distribution of um, power generation across the country. So, um, you know, we have energy going into the, the um, Eastern Australian network uh, from, you know, Queensland and from South Australia and from Victoria. So there is never going to be a case where the sun is not shining somewhere and the wind is not blowing somewhere. That's a network issue that I, I can't speak to. Technology just doesn't support any of that at the moment. Uh, we need yeah, the, the, the networks definitely need to upgrade to take account of a much more distributed and a, a, a two-way kind of system that it hasn't had to do um, in the past. Um, Evo Energy uh, are definitely looking at these sorts of network upgrades and the smart technology that needs to, to accompany um, a lot of distributed power. Thank you. Any more questions there? Okay, thank you Kirsten. I really enjoyed that.
That's twice in one day. Um, I think some of those questions are great. It shows we're running an open forum here, and it also shows those who campaigned to head to the gas free where they need to do more work. It also still highlights the wood fire issue, which is alive and burning, I suppose. Um, thank you. <laughs> the Council's budget submission has just gone up and it talks about air quality monitoring. And we've been banging on about this for since the bushfires. And um, we're proposing to government be very wise to invest in some air quality monitoring stations out this way so we can define the problem with airborne pollutants. Personally, I think it's an issue, but I've got my own little station. It tells me what I think I need to know, that when it's fine and clear in Monash, it can be fouled here with nitrous oxides and all sorts of things. So we're going to keep on banging on on that. Um, the other, which I've just learned this evening, thank you Marissa, Marissa's chairing an inquiry into renewable energy. And um, our submission went up, I believe, this evening. There's also a private submission that went up that's pretty challenging out there. Um, look, worth a read, and I encourage everybody to get involved in the debate. It's, I've had the good fortune of working in a couple of jobs where I've learned a fair bit about it, because I had to, and I also had done some private reading. Um, the climate change stuff is real, and we need to accept it, we need to live with it, and we need to work out how to not ruin our lifestyle along the way. We still have a right to be warm in our homes, still have a right to cook our meal, um, we still have a right to not get gouged at the bank by a network provider, and these are all challenges for government. Um, so yeah, we're pointing that out in our submissions, and like I said, I encourage everybody to read those submissions, engage, talk to your MLAs, they're making decisions about where we're going. Our energy self-sufficiency is very important, but so is our qual the quality of our air and the climate we live in. Okay, enough said from me on that. Um, look, I'm going to hand over to our two MLAs that are here. I have an apology from Julia Jones. She's doing something with doctors tonight. Straw. Who drew the short straw? <laughs> Hello, Emma Davidson, MLA for Murrumbidgee, a big fan of climate science. Um, look, there's a, a few things that I wanted to tell you about tonight, but I actually wanted to just start by um, saying a big thank you to Tom Anderson for his 14 years of work um, for the Community Council. Uh, a well-functioning Community Council is really important for people like me to better understand what it is that the local community needs. Um, and what you're thinking about things and to have somewhere where we can come out and say hey we're, we're thinking about doing this what do you think of that and to have that conversation um, so I, I just wanted to say thank you to, to Tom for all the, the work that he's doing he's, he has done very much appreciated of things to tell you about. Uh, last week I announced the, um, the successful applicants for the second round of Community Connections grants. So these grants were funded through um, COVID-19 Stimulus uh, Community Resilience and Crisis Response Initiative, which is a lot of words to basically say that uh, ACT government was recognising the impact that COVID-19 had on our community's ability to stay connected with each other and uh, understanding that what strengthens and makes community resilient is being able to find ways to connect with each other and work on the things that, that we're all interested in together. So uh, the grants totaled $98,200 and uh, fund projects all over Canberra um, in things like you know, arts, uh, sporting activities, uh, um, 
uh, community groups getting together uh, and all sorts of things, but uh, also included funding for the Molonglo Valley Community Forum to be able to live stream meetings. Um, one of my personal favourites was uh, free trapeze workshops for Canberrans over the 50 years of age. Um, there's all sorts of fun stuff that, that has been funded with this uh, and very exciting to see happen. So you'll start to see things happening in your community um, that were funded through those grants. Uh, one to tell you about that's coming up now, uh, Minister Rebecca Bassarotti has opened applications for um, the very popular ACT Government Community Garden Grants. Uh, there's $40,000 available and uh, what it's for is to help not-for-profit community groups to do community garden projects. Um, so uh, there's up to $10,000 available per project. Um, and uh, there have been quite a number of community gardens that have been funded through these grants. I opened one in Pierce last week. Um, it's it, an absolutely beautiful way to really connect with your local community. Uh, the grants, uh, the applications will close on the 28th of June um, and you can find out more about those on the ACT Environment website. Um, does anyone have questions for me? Where is your Pierce? Oh, the Pierce Community Garden is at the Pierce Community Centre, a uh, place I am a little bit familiar with. Um, it, they've got a fantastic community garden that they've built there. It's, they've got uh, veggie gardens going, so uh, there are people from the local community centre, including the Disability Support Services organisation there, who are working on the garden, but it also means that people in the surrounding community can come in and work on the veggie garden as well um, and enjoy the, the community gardens that they've got there and really make that community centre a part of the surrounding Pierce suburb. I'm sorry, yeah. this is Floriata related? No, not Floriata related. It's just because we think gardens are really beneficial, community gardens are really beneficial not just for the environment but also for community strengthening and resilience. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it is really important that we maintain the trees that we've got as well as planting planting new trees. Planting new trees is very important and we are committed to getting another 54,000 trees planted um, over, I can't remember how many years it is, um, uh, I think it's over the, over the next four years, but it, there's really, we've got to maintain the trees that we've got as well. Um, yeah. So uh, we've just finished our National Volunteering Week. Um, I, I'm the Minister responsible for volunteers. Uh, and I noticed when I went out to the Volunteering Expo that there are quite a few land care groups um, and uh, wildlife care groups that were looking for volunteers. One of the things that's happened over the past 18 months is a lot of community organisations that rely on volunteers have seen their, their volunteers unable to keep participating because they needed to socially isolate because of the public health risk um, or because some of the activities that they would normally do needed to shut down because they couldn't be safely done while socially distanced. Um, now that we're uh, able to get back out there again and, and start doing some of the things that we used to do, it's really important that people are able to get back out there and participate in those volunteering activities. Trees is one of those examples. So, for example, in the suburb that I live in, we've got a, a local group of residents who volunteer to plant trees, but then also to maintain and look after them. And one of the great benefits of doing it that way is that we get to know our neighbours because we're physically out there looking after the trees and talking to each other about who's doing what and you know who's got the time capacity to come out and how often to check that the, the new trees have got enough water and that sort of thing. Um, 
it's again another example of your strengthening the community as well as improving your local environment. Mm -hmm. The trees that I was talking about were trees along the pathway um, um, and in the greenway of course mm -hmm. and, uh, and nobody's really touched them. And they haven't planted them into water. Yeah, yeah. A good job creation. I can pass that on to city services. Yeah. yeah. Also, you can get on to the government and tell them if you see a tree being neglected. Oh, I do too. I'm sure they've got me on red alert. Um, I've actually got a fellow coming out, he comes out every couple of weeks in a truck with fertiliser and water. And we've got a beautiful crop of trees growing in a little park over the road. Just cannot get people to stop parking in the park. We could have an argument about that very easily. There's two schools of thought here. Um, I see deciduous trees falling down too. Anyway, I'm not my slot. I, I just wanted to mention one other thing. Uh, someone was asking about. So someone was asking earlier about where they've seen wombats in the local area. Uh, we've seen one in Coolo Park. Um, just wanted to let you know that I've seen one there. Um, <laughs> They do exist, they do come into the suburbs, and it just makes it all the more important that we uh, keep an eye out for the wildlife in our suburbs and make sure that, you know, in really hot weather, that there's water out and, and things like that. Thank you, Emma. I don't, I don't know if this is your area, probably not, but you know how oh. they've banned the plastics? You know that that means that they're killing more trees, cutting down more trees, because now you're getting wood cut or Plates, wood, 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 everything, and that's bad. What can you do? Is that in there? Kind of is in a funny way. Oh, good. Uh, so, okay, with the uh, with the the ban on single use plastics that's currently being phased in, um, uh, where I have some some particular interest in that is how it impacts on people with disabilities. Um, so, as the the ACT Minister for Disability, that's something that that I've. I've had to um, you know, take a good look at and work with the community on what what would be the impacts on them and how to deal with it. Um, wooden cutlery is not necessarily a replacement that suits everyone. And so for actually quite a lot of people, um, regular reusable uh, metal cutlery is actually going to work better than a, um, a, a bamboo uh, disposable um, item because they need something that's that's going to have a bit more strength and resilience to the, the item itself. Um, so yes, yeah, so I have got an interest in that and uh, we are talking about ways in which we can make sure that the community is well supported to have the right uh, implements that give them uh, the functionality that they need for their specific purpose. Yeah, and of course the problem is also more paper plates more paper bags as well, and that means again more trees are being cut down to supply what that was before we were reducing the cutting down of trees by having the plastic cutlery and so forth, plastic plates, better. paper plates anyway, because you end up eating paper plates because you go to the bar and you put bars. Yeah, even the plates as well. <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we may well find that with the uh, move away from disposable plastic products that uh, more people go to using washable, reusable you know, metal cutlery and, and um, you know, china plates and, and things like that. And that would be a great thing for everyone too. Thank you very much, Emma. I've got a question about NDIS, but I'll save that till next time. <laughs> I could talk for hours about it. I know, I heard it. Marisa, um, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, my name's Marisa Patterson. I'm one of the other MLAs from uh, Murrumbidgee. Um, I also would like to follow on from Emma's comments and uh, thank and acknowledge Tom Anderson's work in, uh, with the Western Creek Community Council and in the community over the past decade or so. I think um, he'll be very missed and I'm uh, yeah, very disappointed I don't get to work with him longer in this position. Uh, I also acknowledge you, Andy, and I'm sorry I missed your talk. Um, we also had a wombat in Warramanga just a few weeks ago. So. Um, yes, and really supportive of what Yolandi's doing. 
Um, so there's a few things uh, to sort of report back on tonight. One thing that I think I've uh, sort of shared with the council is the um, there's district planning workshops for each area in the ACT. This is part of the ACT planning review. So there's a specific Western Creek one, which is the 8th of June um, from 6 p.m. till 9 p.m. So if anyone's interested in that, I think you can still register online. Um, and so, yeah, your input is very valuable and uh, greatly welcomed. Um, dog registration. So the laws passed in the assembly last uh, sitting and uh, you will need to re, re well, you register your dog when you first get your dog, uh, but you'll need to renew your registration every year. Um, there's no charge to do this, but you uh, need to be aware that you will need to do and update your um, address details. I think that comes in uh, in July, so the June, July. Soon. Soon, yes. Uh, I have, I'm doing a mobile office tomorrow at the front of Coolum Court, the Woolworths side, with uh, Minister Gentleman. Uh, so if anyone would like to come down and have a chat about police services and the new police services model in the ACT and any feedback, uh, I, he, he will be there with me and I'm really excited about that. So um, please come down and join us. At uh, 3 p.m. till 4. Yep, uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow? Yes. And yeah, uh, as Bill was saying, we've got uh, inquiries sort of running at the assembly at the moment. So the renewable energy innovation inquiry that has just closed for submissions. So the submissions are up online and we will get to hearings and things over the following weeks. Um, and the other inquiry that I've been involved with the last two weeks has been the ACT election inquiry. So this happens after every election, every four years, sort of a review of the legislation and what has happened. And uh, the last two weeks we've had public hearings on that, which have been very interesting. I, I think I wasn't quite prepared to like go back into core flute talking and discussions and debates, but we've been having that. And uh, today, yeah, we had half the day with the different parties um, and independents giving evidence, which was very interesting. So if you are interested, uh, you can go online to the Assembly website and, and listen. <laughs> but it may be, yes, yeah, select interest. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, yeah, so the upgrades to Brearley Street uh, is... Um, sorry, I've just blinded myself. Uh, that is something that over the next few months uh, we'll, the government will start to come and um, talk to the community about. Uh, but I'm going to start aim to start having conversations with the Western Creek community around that and the council. I'm really interested to go through your um, survey that you ran. Um, and uh, yeah, so that process will start and I'm keen to start that as soon as possible, get as much feedback as we can and feed that into the official consultation process. Um, finally, I am going to focus my social media on recycling and similar to this theme next month. And I'm going to be doing a tour of the ACT's recycling discovery hub, uh, which there's 10 places to come and tour on the tour with me on the 15th of June. And it's yeah, a, a, a chance to see the facility and um, understand how we do recycling in the ACT. So you can, um, yeah, it's on my website or Facebook and you can engage with that if you're interested. So thank you. Okay, so there's a new um, ACT police services model. So this was funded last year and uh, it's $33 million funding package, which uh, will uh, fund th 69 new police officers. I think two thirds of them are currently now serving. Um, and basically the model is a preventative model. It's about what I, how it's been explained to me is that it's a, um, UK-based model that uh, has been highly successful over in the UK and there's a lot of evidence behind it. It's very much about community-based policing. So it's about police being out about in the community, knowing 
community members you can go and talk to them um, it's yes yeah, sort of rather than having police sit in stations it's about them being out and about and prevention is key linking people up to services that type of thing so this is what what is going to happen over yeah the next few years can I just make an observation we've yes. been in the UK for five years yep. we had bobbies walk past our place every couple of days uh, in the yeah. local park there were bobbies mm. in Canberra we never saw, saw a police car and a police car driving you know, yeah. down the street yeah that's uh, right and we know that we didn't have much crime in our area there yeah uh, it just really does work just yeah. the visibility of it but I also make another observation I've been coming up to these meetings on and off for a while and for a long time dismayed at how few MPs, local MPs, came to these meetings, mm. how little connection there was between local government and actually community level. And to see two MPs here tonight is really fantastic. And, mm. uh, you know, I just hope I see it every yeah. time. Yeah. Apparently yeah. there's a community safety unit and they're actually police. Then you've got an elders unit, like after us oldies. <laughs> so they're doing good things actually. Yeah, 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 and feedback from the I'm community. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, Mary, so how how do we explain then the behaviour, the re the recent stuff that's been going on, which could have been avoided with that community level policing? It took what three months for that issue to get resolved in Fisher, and it's still ongoing, and people are kind of going a bit feral about it, let's be honest, it was sort of fracturing our community. And it's only now that that's, something's kind of happened there. Can we look forward to this sort of policing really actively being, you know, rolled out in our area, or is that what... Um, so what I, I would say since the end of January, there's been a lot going on in relation to that Fisher mm -hmm. incident. And um, it has been an ongoing thing for many months and a lot of people have been working on it and a lot of police and it's got to a point now. Um, and I, I think, you know, we really need to be getting, as much as it's about getting police here, we need to be getting services here, but people also need to want to have service providers you know, in their life and part of their um, future and so I think yeah it's about this getting the services to Western Creek as well and you know I've been um, you know I met with Ted and uh, this week and Men's Link and I think promoting what they're offering young people in our community they're doing some great work which I didn't know about and you know I'm sure that a lot of people in the community don't know about it and so you know if you've got disengaged young people um, we we want to get them you know the help the supports whatever they need and so I think it's it's a dual response um, that we need and ultimately we don't want a criminal justice response um, you know we want to avoid that um, and uh, yeah we want to support people in the community so I guess that's my approach my take on that thank you Good question. Um, under the police services model, are we going to get a police person stationed here who we will know, who might sit in a shop there and operate out of a shop in Coolan Court, like you see in the village all over the country, except for the ACT? Uh, Marissa will be there tomorrow. With uh, I'll be there with the Minister. Um, yeah. <laughs> So I think this would be a really good thing to put to the minister tomorrow. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure. Like, uh, yeah, look, uh, yes, I think it would be a really good discussion to have with him, and I would be supportive of that discussion. <laughs> so those of you watching online, I'll get you. And those of you here, meet gentlemen, three o'clock. Please go down and ask that question. Um, I was just going to say that in the UK, the their police. It's all run by local governments. While in the ACT, particularly, we had a well, some call it issues. Uh, that our, our local government is run by the federal government, even though it is all about ACT police uh, all part of the feds. There uh, just an arm of the federal police. And there was a report about 
just recently released around issues about how the ACT use certain federal um, services that we've heard. Um, uh, and I just wondering, and taking into account that the crime rates are across the board worse in the UK, um, how, if this has been filed in the UK, how closely can it be um, used in the camera? Because we're, we, I've lived in the UK in numerous places, and I would say that I feel safer at any given time in Canberra than yes. I ever would in the UK. Um, yeah, look, I mean, my argument coming from uh, academia previously to this role is that you need to have an evidence base. So whatever you do, whatever sort of yeah, new model you're implementing, I think you really need evidence, uh, ongoing um, evidence uh, to back up what you're doing. And so, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's what I would like to see and that's what I will be uh, inquiring to the minister about, you know, what what are the outcomes expected of this new model, and yeah, what can we expect to see? Yeah. It comes down to the end resources. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really yeah. problem. Yeah. A big problem. Does this address that? Yes, absolutely. And I do think 69 new police officers will have an impact. It's quite significant. Yes. Yes. Yes, well, that's what uh, we might see Bill down at the front of Cooler tomorrow. All, of you down, thank you. <laughs> all right, thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you, Marissa. Um, moving on to the general business of the organisation that we have to do. Um, minutes from the meeting of the 28th of April. Have any of you read them? All of you read them? They're available there. Um, can somebody move that they be accepted? Thank you, Mark. And seconded by Rosemary. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there any business arising from those minutes? Um, is there something you can do about the fact that the fencing laws of the government is trying to uh, impose to have to do with the fence 200 metres inside the boundary. That's not business from the minutes, Nora. Um, That's not possible. How about you send us an email about it and we can find out what the issue is, if you don't mind? Because it's at the point of time. Yeah, understood. 200 metres inside. I understood what you're saying. Can you get us some, something on that and we'll follow it up for you? Um, when we don't have a treasurer's report tonight. We'll give a double one next month. Um, moving on to general business, reports from the committee. Well, we've had quite a hectic month with um, the various resignations. We've had three members of the committee leave. So we're down to a skeleton. Um, Michelle Weston, you want to put your hand up? <laughs> Sorry, Michelle, has agreed to join us. And Michelle's got a lot of interest in local affairs. Um, and we've got an ongoing call for volunteers. It's not a closed shop. Any of you can participate in some of our activities and we do continually ask for help. Um, we're about to ask for another bit of help shortly. Um, even, you know, just stacking up the chairs at the end of the meeting, pulling your chairs out, you know, all the stuff that might take five or ten minutes if there's many hands, very helpful. And appreciate those that do. Another set of hands, even better. Um, if you want to join the committee, please have a talk to one of the committee members, send us an email to info out or just contact us even through that horrible Facebook Messenger. Uh, happy to have a chat about what we get up to. Um, we have agreed the AGM will be in August, um, and that's around the accountant looking at the books and certifying them. It's been correct that we've slotted into that schedule, so it can't be any earlier. So we're going to run on the interim arrangements until August, and then we'll have a proper AGM we will call for nominations um, in the month before and we will go from there. Um, I invite anybody who's eligible to nominate. 
It'll be good to see some new faces on the committee. Um, and we'll see where we go. Um, Simone, do you want to talk about the Florio pop-up? Sorry, could you have me? Um, so um, we've been lucky enough to get um, some more, um, oh, we've been chosen to participate in the Floriard Community Project again this year. We did it last year during COVID. You would have noticed maybe if you're up at Chapman on the corner of Street and Drive and Darwinian Terrace, we did a display. There was about 50 local people that would regularly pop through and tend to the patch and um, yeah we had a thousand bulbs and a thousand annuals last year and this year we're getting two thousand so it's twice as much fun um, and yeah so um, we really enjoyed doing um, that as an activity with the community council and with the locals and if anyone wants to join us this year there's plenty of opportunities we are Bulbing, we are planting on the Sunday the 6th of June between 11 and 4 p.m. And anyone can just drop past um, or you can shoot us an email and let us know when you want to come um, and we can organise a specific patch or something. We're sort of coordinating volunteers. But um, yeah, we'll be working on that for the next three months. Um, and yeah. Oh, yeah, there's information on the back of the newsletter as well, by the way. You want to take that? Any questions? Um. What we introduced last meeting, because we had spare time, was a have your say session to allow people to point us towards issues that are affecting their lives in the community. We think it worked, and the feedback we got. Um, am I brave enough to say, tell us if it didn't work? No, I'm not. Um, seriously. Um, is there a couple of things came up that we weren't aware of. One matter I can report has been attended to. There's something about a, what we think was attended to, because when I went down there to look, there was a, the water guy down there fixing the pipe you know, that you raised in your rosemary. Sorry, were you speaking of? Sorry? The, the, the odour down. Yes, I walked past there on Tuesday. It was still evident that not as bad as it has been, so I don't know whether it's been attended to all that. Yeah, okay. Maybe we'll just raise it again. But if, if you could approach the TCCS or access camera about it, then obviously they'll come and have a look at it. But well, the man was down there when I went down to take a photo. I went down to take a photo to send okay. to them, okay. and he was there okay. crawling around working on it. We'll try harder though, see if they can improve it. Well, I'll keep, I'll keep the monitor on it. Okay. And just see what happens. Okay, thank you. It depends a bit on the weather. Yeah. Uh, which way the wind is blowing and it's whether it's foggy or something. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other things, Val? Last meeting, I requested a copy for me and my wife of the Egg Engineering Report in to be sent to the council. Would you receive anything? We haven't. Um, it's, like I said, it's been a crazy month. We will pursue that again. The air conditioning report. Yes, yeah. there was one that was checking on the standard of the air conditioning. Okay. Post, post bush fires. Yeah. I thought it might have been relevant. Okay, we'll find out what's out there. Um, one other thing I forgot to say, but I didn't put in the notes. The village building company proposal down on the old AFP site was rejected last Friday. Oh, rejected. Rejected, yeah, by ACAT. Um, so we put it on our website, the whole decision. It's worth a read. Um, council joined the directorate in opposing it, we joined the matter. 
uh, we felt they could have done a lot better. Um, and we ran the arguments, ACAD accepted it and um, rejected the thing totally. And when you looked at the detail, it was not a good offer and as a gateway site to the area, over 10 or 15 years, it would have been quite disappointing in our view where it ended up. So what's going to be doing there now? They are going back to the drawing board. So it could be something worse. Well, I don't think it'd be worse. I hope it's something better. But if it's, if it's worse, it'll be rejected again. Has everyone heard that, you know, how it unfolded and everything, and what our role was? No, I mean, I'm happy just to speak for a couple of minutes on yeah, it. Yes, you know, yes, the summary. Yes, yeah. Warwick, 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 yeah. Development. That, first of all, it's important to understand that the Western Creek Community Council is in favour of development done responsibly. So it's it's about looking at the strengths and weaknesses of any development. We, of course, we do recognise that there is with investment comes jobs and opportunities and all sorts of things. So we are actually a positive organisation who listens to the community. And then on this occasion, it was getting confusing because the original design, while it wasn't supported by everyone, it had a lot of merit. The original design actually had higher density in the middle of the development, and then it had lower density around the outside, so it seamlessly sort of um, went towards the existing community. Um, neither of them had, were particularly kind to the tree growth, and that was a bit of an issue. So, um, basically, the story that we got from, from the developers was that the, they were having trouble with the ACT government because the planning rules were so convoluted that they were trying to, make, trying to do something innovative but the, the, um, the leasing and planning rules were frustrating them constantly. So they actually presented back to us and said, so we've come up with one that fits the rules and we know it's not as good but we can make a profit on it and it meets the rules. Uh, the second one that was proposed was so unimaginative that the Western Creek Community Council were concerned uh, because it, it really did not add much to the environment, the, the visual environment and the amenity of the area. It basically was just a whole stack of row houses stuck together very closely, very, very narrow um, roads, um, didn't really offer it, when you are asked the question, so what's the net advantage to building this? There wasn't any. There weren't any. There was just this, this development was really just a, a bunch of row houses, like you'd see in the UK 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 years ago. They had some green drawings. Yeah, they, I mean, gardens are what is in your imagination from those drawings may not be what there was intended. There's some, it's, um, we've got to be careful with, with lots of green, green water colour color on, on plants. Um, it doesn't always mean that they are well developed, well managed gardens with mature trees in deep, you know, deep planting and so on. So that, that's sort of like a snapshot of why we got involved. Now Pat McGinn and, and Tom Anderson put in days and days and days and days going along with this protracted thing that dragged on for about six months. Unbelievable really. They stuck at it. and. Um, and then that's why there's, what is it, 150 pages or something of deliberations, which go all, it's very legalistic. ACAD is a legal organisation run by lawyers, so guess what, you get legalistic language rather than practical solutions, because they're not practical people, they're lawyers. So that's just the nature of it. We're not, I'm not criticising, stating facts. So that's the nature of the, the findings. They tend to be legalistic, interpretive, and the net result is, Go back to the drawing board, try harder. So, is there anything more to add to that, Bill? Yeah. No, Anyone else? Is that massive on street drive? Are we looking at a different area? Yes. You know where Hyson Street is and Street Drive, and you know, like. The one that's been back in for a couple of years. Yeah, if you're relatively new to the area, right? Oh, I'm not in 2018, so. Okay, right up. Yeah, okay. Well, it used to be the AFP training headquarters. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah well used. I read through that stuff. I didn't read through everything, but the thing I noticed was they 
rejected it. One of the reasons they gave was it wasn't in the character of Western Creek. Mm. Well, it's a three story or a post street. They yeah. didn't even know it in the beginning. Yeah. They didn't even know about the Northwestern concept plan. They had two areas that were not allowed to have three stories. Yeah. And their excuse was it was not three stories, it was one meter below ground. And they just looked like ski resorts all over the mm. post street, looked straight into our houses. No, and they wanted to remove every single tree on it, the whole lot. Oh, yeah. yes, no, it, it had all in the, uh, the second plan. And then they, in the second plan, they put third, the third entrance onto Pison Street. And it's a very busy road now. We get all the long road going down to Wyden. Um, uh, that wasn't so much on the details, and that sort of stuff is, is, so what is this character of Western Creek? Yeah. And I thought, give me that definition because is there something we should be using elsewhere? The character of Western Creek. So, so oh, def know, definitely. Mark, I think. Simone's got something to say. Yeah, we should place it. Yeah, we'll go to Simone, then we'll go to Michelle. Yeah, Excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that something that um, what we were discussing is the character of Western Creek. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, what we were discussing is the character of Western Creek is sort of somewhat this clearly defined line of, across um, John Gordon Drive by where we're not terrace houses but you'll find in Malonglo and we don't want to see this planning creep into, into Western Creek where all of a sudden um, we're knocking down and having blocks and blocks of houses and suddenly five-storey developments and all of a sudden losing our character which has been built over 50 years. Values that we have in Western Creek are not the same values that perhaps Malonglo shares, whether they're design values, whether they're, you know, our, you know, like our values of having space and um, you know, and certain amenities, etc. It's just a bit different. Their characteristics are different, and I'm a little bit conservative, or you know, I, I'd like to maintain or preserve the character that's here, mm -hmm. as opposed to having. You may have noticed during the election, Beck Cody came through and was like, "Oh yeah, we're going to sweep through, and they want to put planning. You know, we're going to have this blanket planning across town." Well, that will remove some of the character, which will happen eventually anyway. But I think, you know, it's probably. That's probably a good way of explaining um, what we were essentially trying to preserve there. It's just having a line where it's like, like Val's house, you know, it's not three stories and having that creep straight into Western Creek. So, um, yeah. I have to concur with what you're saying. And once you start letting those buildings, those higher buildings, mm -hmm. a few here or there, they always say, oh, it's just one here, just one there. Then all of a sudden, that will become a character of the year and you'll get those across. And like I remember when they did the um, high density housing across Canberra, because I worked for a consultant, I actually went to the street and asked people fully um, whether they wanted high density housing across Canberra. And I remember pretty much everyone who didn't live in high density housing said, no, I didn't want it. And then what did the government do? They just said, oh, well, we'll show this um, survey. Yeah, I just wanted to add that I went to, is that too loud? I went to a stakeholders um, workshop today. It's going to be a series of them and it's about the planning reform and review. And hot off the press, uh, the definition of character came up today and they're looking for definitions, but what what a big part of the agenda is, which I, I'm pretty excited about, is they want to introduce district plans. So there's going to be consultation about what the residents think is the character of their area to develop district plans that sit under the territory plan. So I really encourage you to go to the workshop, if you can, on the 8th of June at the Stirling Labor Club. I think it starts at 6pm. You can register online. Uh, they they'll then let you know. You can do it online or in person, but they're very interested, and I think we need to keep them accountable if they're really seriously talking about this district plan and them being individual. I don't know what the boundaries are that they're using for the district, whether, whether it's electorates, where it's, whether it's community councils, that's the question I've got, but I really encourage you to go because that is what they're telling us that they're going to do next 
and that is the beginning of the consultation for it. The other day on Twitter, somebody said a Western Creek Community Council meeting isn't complete unless it's talked about parking for two and a half hours. <laughs> We're not going to talk about parking for two and a half hours, I can assure you, because I think we all want to go home and have a sip of a red or something. Um, but we wrote a letter to the government last April asking you they do various things rather than do the Kulo Park um, construction of spending a lot of money to get very few car parks. Um, they came back to us last week and have asked us to meet with them tomorrow. Um, we're going to walk around and have a conversation about our, the letter we wrote and it's about doing the paint a bit better. Um, looking at some spots that are underutilised, like the park and ride over in Leonard Street. And they're going to present some plans for us. And we are then going to come back here and survey you. So we'll, we'll put together a survey, put it out on our social media and on our website. And I believe they're also going to come next month to our meeting along with, stop the presses, we finally got Chris Steele to come. So Chris Steele's coming next month. He's going to talk about all these things around here. You probably noticed, and I want to clarify it, it looks like they're starting to work on traffic lights on the three troublesome intersections around here, which are Brewley Street and Hindmarsh Drive, Nemajura and Streeton, and the pesty one down at Hyson. Right. right. So you can see holes being dug, surveyors on the road, you see cabling done, there's some concrete laid. I can only but assume it's for traffic lights. I hope they'll tell us that tomorrow. Um, can you make a budget committed to signal yes. and street, so it's probably that. Yeah, so I dare say they're gonna rush before next month's meeting to get done. Yes. That's awfully dangerous, you know, up to, it goes up to, say, June, you go in and... Oh, look, if you... There was a massive car accident there two days ago, and it's always a car accident there every yeah. day, multiple times yeah. a day. Um, mm -hmm. If you read Council's budget submission, which is now up on the Chief Minister's website, submission number 58, not that I've been stalking it, it's very clearly in there, and we say there's no point really in doing a couple, because all you're going to do is move the trouble elsewhere. Our prediction is Mully Street will be the next pressure point. I use Mully Street every day. I just shake my head at some of the things I see. I've never seen the worst intersection. Exactly. It's terrible. Including that horrible rail in the middle. Do you drive an SUV? Yeah, you're, you're higher. You drive a little car, lower, you go, what on earth is going on? And we've had people say to us, I had recently some message me, they'd come across somebody who'd given up driving because of that intersection. They said, you know, I'm a hostage. I'm, I like my little car, it's low, goes well, just doesn't do that intersection very well. That is also in our submission. Left lane must turn left. Yes. Right lane goes straight through, which means the people coming out of Mulling Street only have to get into one right traffic instead of two. Agreed. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's the last meeting here, Julia Jones. Hi, Julia. Actually, I think it's the last meeting here, Julia. Actually, said, well, who, 
Who thought of that silly idea? I'm afraid I don't know the answer, but it's certainly well known. Cycle path. If the cycle path doesn't go anywhere when it gets to an amateur, it stops. We've got our pedal power friend here, he might. That. But it's, it's not even a cycle lane. It's yes. It's a dead bit of road that could be used for okay. turning it. You're speaking to the converter? Okay. Very much so. It's also a very handy overtaking lane, I've noticed later. Oh, I haven't tried that. <laughs> <laughs> Say yep. that um, when that originally changed, yep. I spoke to the guy at the roads. Yeah. Um, I think his name's Slobodan. Um, he's the same guy. He's been there for years and years and years. But um, he explained to me because I was like, "That's that's a bad idea." And he was like, "No, no, no. We've done all this traffic engineering stuff, and and it'll be fine." And initially, it was fine, but because of the in increased traffic that's coming up from right and Coombs, Etc. on the long yeah. road, it's now outdated. So okay. I think you'll find it's probably the same guy, he's in the same job at ACT Roads. Is it Terry Gill? Tony, Tony Gill. Tony Gill. Tony, no. Tony, yeah, Tony Gill. Tony he's Gill. The, and then there's, there's yeah. another guy. And they're quite reasonable, but we just need to yeah. get him I there think it's not Tony might have moved on, you know, yeah, There's two women in there yeah. who seem to be running the design area now, um, but we are going to give Chris Steele a series of questions based on the feedback we get in tonight, plus other feedback, plus our budget submission, just plus wandering around, and we're going to ask him questions about what are you going to do about this, and see if we can get some answers. And I hope you all come and back us up. That accident's quite bad as well, though there was four cars on the road, so I only saw two later on when I was car, and they were just doing the road, and it was called Crush. So mm -hmm. they, you know, I don't know what they were doing, but it was wrong in many ways. It was a bad accident from one of the bison. Yeah. I'm surprised I didn't see any photos in the Mully Street one. So they usually get out there on social media pretty quickly. Yeah, so is there any other substantive issues anybody wants to raise? Can I just say something? Yeah, please. You got a Sorry, I just wanted to say something. I know you touched on before about us wanting volunteers, but I just um I just thought I'd put it out there that we we really do have quite a, a bit of really good work to do as part of the committee. Um, we, have, we do lots of really interesting things. Um, so I don't really think that we need you guys to stack chairs or whatever. What we need is numbers of um, um, qualified, experienced, passionate people who maybe have, you don't have to commit all the time, but even if you can just come sometimes, you can kind of cherry pick the work that we do as well. Um, we have interesting submissions that, you know, what we're talking about now, right? Just, just things like writing a letter um, to the appropriate area um, once a month. Maybe you want to pick up on a particular topic. There's plenty of opportunities there to get involved. It's not just that we need help. It's more that we really want to grow our capacity to consult um, more regularly and in a different style with our community. And we do really want to progress it. As, as Warwick said before, we're not against development. We're not against, um, we don't want to counter things. We want to get more onto the front foot and really kind of impact our district to the benefit of generations to come. So if that's something that interests you, then, and you've got maybe a couple of hours um, a month, we, our committee meetings are on the third Thursdays between 7.30 and 10. Um, you can drop in if you want to come try it out. Um, or, and yeah, and then we have this, um, and then we have the, the council meetings on the fourth Wednesday. The last, which, uh, the Wednesday. last Wednesday of the month. And um, yeah, there's plenty of scope there to do some really interesting stuff. Um, so yeah, if you've got time and you want to come along to a committee meeting, shoot Michelle an email and um, please, please come. Love to have you. I can call entirely. Okay, can I, anything else? One last call, like an auction. Um, 
I think we can declare the meeting closed at 9.35. Um, up by five minutes. <laughs> Thank you all for coming, especially the people we haven't seen before.